message is titled, How to Be Happy. How many of you just really would like to learn how to be happy in your life? You know, it's sad that some of us, we just walk through life just existing, just trying to make it from one day to the next, just trying to make it to from, from, from one situation, and it seems like one bad situation to the next situation. And, and, and some of us, we've gotten used to that type of lifestyle, and even there are people that's built in their theology that, you know, if you feel happy and you feel good, then you're not spiritual. You know, you have to suffer, you have to, in order to, I'm serious, there, there's this church in L.A. that I used to preach all the time, thousands of people, and, 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 their, and their model was, nothing is easy with God, and they're right from one aspect, but when you have God in you, no matter what you're going through, He's going to help you through it, and He wants us, He desires for us, to learn to be happy. And one of the things that we really have to understand, and it's going to tie in with, with the message here tonight, one of the things that we need to learn to understand is, is, is happiness and, 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 and joy, true joy and true happiness comes from the inside rather from things on the outside. And so the message tonight is a message that um, I really wish that I could just stop and do two or three weeks on it, but we don't have the time for that. But Matthew chapter 5 and verse 6 says, Happy are those who are hungry and thirsty for righteous, for, for true goodness. King James says for righteousness. For they will be fully satisfied. Hungry and thirsty for righteousness, for goodness, for they will be satisfied. Here in the United States, most of us don't really understand what it means to be hungry. Sometimes I'll forget my lunch when I go to work. At about 11 o'clock, I think I'm dying of hunger. But the reality is, I've already eaten twice that morning. <laughs> One of the things my doctor did tell me is I need to skip a few more meals. But we really don't understand what hunger is. When I was doing evangelistic work, <coughs> um, we had a program called Missy Span, which was working in Matagalpa, Nicaragua, and we were building all of these projects, and we were putting, uh, building hospitals and medical clinics and schools. Um, one of the things that happened when the Sandinistas took over down there, they would not let the children of Christians go to school. So we started all of these um, um, <coughs> schools and stuff, and. And, and really, they were already started. We were just aligning with them and helping getting them the stuff they needed to, to, uh, to get going. And just show you the poverty of the situation, it cost us $30 a month to pay the full-time salary of a medical doctor in Nicaragua. That's how bad the situation was down there. And one day, <coughs> I had to fly from Nicaragua to Guatemala and then and come back and I had some meetings in, in Guatemala and when I got there uh, I got in this taxi I taken this bus up and I got this taxi to go to the airport and the taxi driver said uh, you know I know you I heard you speak and we were talking and he said you know I like what you're doing down in Mount Tegapa, but he said I'd like to show you if you have time some of the needs here in Managua and I said, well, I've got some time before I have to be to the airport. And he drove me to the side of this mountain, and I wish that I had never gone. There were 100,000 people stuffed into the side of this mountain. They had no running water. There were no homes. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of small children running around, sick, 
malnourished, no clothes. They were all living in cardboard boxes. I mean, literally living in cardboard boxes. Now, in Southern California, they may not be bad, but it rains down there all the time. It was the saddest situation that I have ever seen in my life. A hundred thousand people who had no food, no water, no medical supplies, and people were dying because of basic needs all the time. And Jesus comes here in this verse, and he says that we need to hunger and thirst for goodness. And when we hunger and thirst, see, when we say we're hungry, it's different from what those people and those children in Nicaragua meant by hungry. When, 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 when we say we're hungry, somebody says, if we ask invite some, somebody to invite us to lunch, you want to go to? First, the first thing we ask, well, where are you going? Because we want to decide whether or not we want steak or lobster. Amen, amen, amen. But these kids, they didn't care what it was. They had a need, and you offered them something, they would go running to get and fight over what we're throwing away. They were that hungry. And God tells us here that we need to become that hungry for spiritual things. For Him. And everybody has a spiritual hunger and thirst. Have you ever heard anybody say, my life is empty? I, I, I need to find myself. It used to be that talked about, you know, we need to peel the levels away so we can find ourselves, our inner selves. You know, you do that with an onion. You just keep peeling away. What's in the middle? Nothing. There's nothing there. People are, are, are hungry. They're, they're bored. They're restless. There must be more to life than this. There has to be more. And God says that we should become hungry like that. Even when things are going well and successful. Oftentimes on the inside there's that gnawing feeling that something just isn't right. And God tells us. That that emptiness that we have there leads to unsatisfaction. How many of you, and don't raise your hands, are unsatisfied with where you are in your life right now? God says He wants to satisfy us. So why are so many of us, why are so many people around us, why are there so many big people unsatisfied? Mickey Gilly told us in the 80s that we're looking for love in all the wrong places. We're trying to find something to fill the emptiness. If I could just get away and relax. If I could just get on a boat and cruise somewhere. If I could just get away from my family for just two days. If I could just get a week's vacation for my job. If I could just, if I could just, if I could just. And we come up with all of these things. But satisfaction is not found in pleasure. Ecclesiastes 1.8. It says no matter how much we see. We are never satisfied. No matter how much we hear, we are never content. Most of the ads you see on television, 
It's appealing to that lack of satisfaction in their lives. Even when you go to the store and, and you buy something, satisfaction guarantee. And, and all of these commercials is trying to play on what we're lacking and what we need and what this emptiness is that we have. Have you ever got up in the middle of the night and you went to your refrigerator and you opened it and you stood there for 10 minutes looking for something and then you shut it without taking anything out and then you walk over to the pantry and you open it and you look in and then you turn around and you go back to bed hungry because you couldn't just find that thing because you really didn't even know what it was that you were hungry for. That's what Jesus is referring to here. And people here in Southern California, this is the pleasure capital of the world. And people are looking for all kinds of things. Drugs, alcohol, one night stands. Just go in, you, you can just come here and, and, and spend the entire summer going from one amusement park to the next. When we got out here, we got when we got our kids, Carlos's job bought them a season pass to uh, not very far. That was great. Now, the problem is, they want to go to Magic Mountain, they want to go to Legoland, they want to go to SeaWorld, they want to go to Disneyland. You can just spend an entire summer just going from one place to the next and not have to travel more than 25, 30 miles here. Pleasure capital of the world. But Hebrews 11, 25 tells us that the pleasures of sin, the pleasures of this world, it lasts for a short time and then it passes away. <clears throat> Satisfaction is also not found in performance. All workaholics eventually learn this. One of the, the, the sad things about working for the city is before I left, just before I left, the city bought out all of these contracts and so these people were rushing in and happy and satisfied because they were going to get to retire five, six, seven years early and they couldn't wait and they had this whole list of plans that they were going to do that was three years ago. Guess what? More than half of them are coming back volunteering time and stuff because they're empty and they're trying to find something to satisfy them because they don't know what to do with their time. Pleasure. Looking for purpose and performance. And you don't have to go far to, to look for lives that are broken because of performance. Just turn on your TV. Look at all the athletes. Look at all the movie stars and musicians and singers who are taking the fame and fortune they have and throwing it all the way on a lifestyle that is destroying their lives and their families. And, 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 and when you talk to a lot of them, a lot of it boils back to the pressure that they have. Carlos works for a law firm. <clears throat> and this last week, because of, of uh, Memorial Day weekend, they have this, this party every Friday night. And it's basically for the lawyers to come and, and enjoy themselves and unwind and they decided not to have it because of the long weekend. And the lawyers said, no, we need to have it. We need to have our Miller Lite in order to forget about all of the pressures from the week. Because it's a high-paced, high-pressure job. And they're trying to find the answers in performance.
Number three, it's not found in possessions. Do you know that we have three times more products here in the United States than they had 10 years ago? Three times more products here. And for those of you that have traveled abroad, one of the things I'm sure that you, that you realize, just walk down the cereal aisle of a, of, a, of a supermarket. You go to Central America and they've got three different types of cereals. That's it. They've got a whole aisle as long as this church. And 70 different types of church or cereal for you to choose from. And people are think that they can find satisfaction in the possessions of life. Even when I get what I want, it's not what I want. One of the things when I was, was back at the city before, we had two guys that every time a new cell phone came out, <laughs> They had to take the day off so they could go stand in line all night and pay six, seven hundred dollars, which they did not have, to buy the newest, latest, greatest cell phone that they were going to drop and break three or four weeks later. <laughs> and even if they didn't break it, Within three or four weeks, they were complaining about it because it didn't offer what they thought that it was going to do, and they were already planning and waiting for the next one. That's <laughs> me. <laughs> Not satisfied with anything. We. When Carlos and I first got together almost 19 years now, we lived in a apartment that didn't have any bedrooms in it. We moved from that to another one that had a one bedroom apartment. We moved from that to one who had a two bedroom apartment. We moved from that to one who had a three bedroom apartment. We moved from that to a small mobile home to that, to a large mobile home. And now, Carlos says the other day, you know, maybe we ought to sell this and buy a house. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with progression. There's nothing wrong even if we buy a house. But there is something wrong if you think that buying a house and moving up constantly is going to satisfy the emptiness that you have in your life because possessions will not fulfill you. Ecclesiastes 5.10 says, He who loves money will never have enough. The foolishness of thinking wealth brings happiness. Who was that famous uh, airline navigator? What was his name? Uh, Howard Hughes. They asked Howard Hughes one time, how much is enough? One of the richest men in the world, how much is enough? He said, just a little bit more. Why? Because no matter how much you have, we will never be satisfied because it's never enough. Well, if it's never enough, if it's not possessions, if it's not pleasure, then, then, then where do we find satisfaction? What is the key to finding satisfaction? How do we experience satisfaction in life? Number one. <clears throat> we need to find out what's missing and recognize my real home. <clears throat> one of the problems when I used to date girls, they used to just drive me up a tree. Let's go out to dinner. Okay, let's go. What do you want? Oh, I don't care. Anything is fine. All right, well, let's go get some Italian food. Oh, no, I don't want Italian food. 
<laughs> All right, well, well, let's go over here and get a pizza. No, 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 I don't want pizza. That's Italian. <laughs> well, where do you want to go? Oh, I don't care. You just pick someplace. <laughs> One of the things that you have to do is you have to recognize what you're hungry for and what is missing in your life. There are three facts that we need to make sure that we understand. Number one, we were created spiritual beings. God created us with a, a spiritual life within us and whether we're in Christ or out of Christ, we have an eternal spirit within us and God created us that way. <clears throat> Number two, God created us in order that He could love us and He could have, we could have a relationship with us, that He could know us. God created us with that purpose. Number three, we need to know that our deepest need, your deepest need, is to know God. One of the, the, the misconceptions that, that go around in churches is this idea, well, I'm coming to church in order to look for God. No, you're not. The Bible is very clear. We don't look for God. God is looking for us. And the fact that we're here tonight means that God loves us and He's looking for us. And He has done something to draw each of us, of us to this place tonight in order that He can meet us and we can have an encounter with Him. And He can bring satisfaction to our lives. But it is never us looking for Him. It is always, always, always God looking for us. Well, how does He do that? Deuteronomy 8.3. It says, God humbled you by letting you go hungry and then feeding you with manna. He did this to help you realize that real life comes from obeying every command of God. I mean, look at the situation. They just got out of slavery. They're walking through the desert. They're complaining. Uh, God, Moses isn't taking care of us. God, we don't have anything to eat. God, we're hungry. And God is saying, you're right, you're hungry. I am allowing you to experience hunger. Because, why? Because of all the complaints. Because of all the unsatisfaction. Because of all the things that you're doing. I am the one that am allowing you to experience hungry. Hunger. Why? So that you will look to me and find the answers in me. And God says that everything in the Old Testament was written for our benefits that we could learn from it. <coughs> so while God isn't allowing us to experience hunger in a desert so he can supply manna to us, God is allowing problems and trials to arise in our lives in order for us to realize that we need Him and then He will be free to work and manifest Himself in our lives. If you, if, if you feel that discontentment and feel that dissatisfaction, congratulations! That means God loves you enough to work in your life so that you can feel the, the, these needs and experience which will lead you to Him so that you can have an experience with Him and know Him. We have to, to understand that we have to develop a real hunger for, for, for God and God allows problems in our life to create that hunger for Him. Happy are the hungry. Means we need to understand and get ready. Because God is getting ready to do something in your life. Amen. Amen. Step two. You've got to stop eating spiritual junk food. I 
Isaiah 55, 2 says, We spend, why spend your money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Basically, he's saying, stop wasting your time and money. I am amazed at some of the things that people who were involved in this church and have been involved in church for years are now involved in. We received an, uh, 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 two emails this last week. One came from a gentleman who went up on this mountain and got the spiritual cleansing <coughs> that he got through meditation and chanting. And he has never been so satisfied and free in his life. Another person I was absolutely amazed from has been in church for, as I know, 20 years or so. All of a sudden has left church and decided that they are a native witch doctor. <laughs> and they are finding God's plan and purpose in their life by going to nursing homes and putting these native spells on elderly people in the nursing home. <laughs> And claiming that she is now, for the first time, satisfied in her life. And the tragedy with that is, one, she believes it to be true. He believes it to be true. But I know what's going to happen in the future. They're both headed for a fall because there's a dead end trap. They are eating spiritual junk food. And many of us, and, and many people, have been a part, not just of this church, but a part of church, and they're now out in the world. They want nothing to do with church, and they're justifying it by listening to preachers and teachers on the radio and on the television, which I have nothing against, except for not everybody on the radio and television are people that you should be listening to. Because a lot of them, all they're interested in doing is filling their pocketbook, number one. And number two, what they're telling you in order to do that is not going to help you grow and connect with God. It's going to do nothing but, but, but give you spiritual junk food that's going to make you sick. we got to stop eating the spiritual junk food. Somebody says, well, you know, I, I, I'm in church, but I really don't have a desire to read the Bible, to pray, and to study. I'm really just not hungry like I used to be. Do you know that lack of appetite is a sign of illness? A sign of sickness. And if you don't have a hunger and thirst for God and His Word, there's something wrong with you spiritually. Number three. We need to start looking to Christ for our satisfaction. John chapter 8 and verse 35. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. Bread. The basic, essential element of food. Whenever you hear a relief effort, like what I talked about in Nicaragua, what's the first thing that they're going to send there? Flour. So that they can use it to make some type of, of bread. That they can get basic nourishment for their lives. We, 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 we need to, to 
to understand that Jesus said, is saying here, I am what you need. I am the one who's going to satisfy you. You need to come to me and you need to eat of me. You need to eat from me. The answer is not even coming to church. The answer is coming to church and having a relationship with Jesus. Coming to church isn't going to develop that. We have to do something and we need to eat from Jesus. But the second part of this is John chapter 4. Verse 13, Jesus says, Whoever drinks water will get thirsty again, but whoever drinks water I give will never be thirsty again. It will become in him a spring of living water. Over 70% of our bodies are water. Every cell in our body depends upon water. And, 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 and Jesus is saying in these two verses, we need to become hungry for God. We need to become thirsty for God. And, and, and you know, there's a, there's a difference. First of all, there's three stages. Number one, I want God in my life. And I think that everybody in this room can honestly say, I want God in my life. I want to eat. I want to drink something. That's something that everybody in this room, I think, has in common. But then there's the next, the next stage, and that is, I need. Have you ever been to Disneyland or one of those parks when it's 95 degrees outside? <laughs> and you forgot to put ice in the water that you brought? And the ice, I mean the, 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 the bottled water is now 105 degrees? And, and you are just absolutely dying of thirst? And, and, and you made a pledge to yourself, I'm not paying $8.50? for a bottle of water at the park, but I can't, I need something to drink, and so I'm going to go spend $8.50. You ever been there? I need. That's the second stage. But there's a third stage. And the third stage is I will do anything. I will do anything. I will pay any price. I will do and sacrifice whatever is necessary in order to get the food and the water. And Jesus is looking for people at the third stage. It's not enough just to understand, oh, I want God, I want to be a good person, I want to come to church. It's not enough to even understand, I need God. God is looking for people who are saying, God, I will do anything, whatever it takes in order to get to you, in order to have a relationship with you, in order to, to, to find a way for you to satisfy this emptiness I have in my life. I will pay any price for it. And here's the good news. You see, people are willing to fast and they're willing to go on these trips and marches and, 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 and Guatemala and, and, and the Holy Week. They will have thousands of people marching on their knees, praying for miles because they think that will get them right with God. But that isn't what you have to do. He says, come, believe. And that's all we have to do. Is by faith realize that I'm hungry. By faith realize life is not satisfying me. By faith I need to come and open up my heart and say, God, I can't do it. I need you. I give you everything that I have. I pick up my cross and follow you. And just like that, 
He will touch your dead spirit. He will bring it to life. And then the Bible says he will fill us with living water. That's the power of the Holy Spirit flowing in and through us, giving us life and strength. The question is, do you want God? Do you need God? Or do you reach the point where you cannot live without God? There's a song that says, my God is real. For I can feel him in my soul. I know God is real. So many people doubt him. But I can't live without him. Amen. Do you want God? Do you need God? Or have you reached the place. Where you're willing to do anything. To have that relationship with him. Because I guarantee you, you make that step of faith, you will find the satisfaction in life that you're looking for. Amen. Because whatever commercial, whatever big multi-billion dollar company, whatever best buy, they can all guarantee you satisfaction guaranteed. No, they're not. <laughs> but with God... It is satisfaction guaranteed that He will give you living water that will satisfy your every need. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus Christ. And God, we come to you hungry and thirsty tonight, knowing that we are in need. And God, our need is so great, we cannot live without you. And we ask, Father, that you would just move by the Holy Spirit. And God, that you would draw us to yourself. And God, we come to you tonight by faith and ask you to take and just draw us to you and help us to, to, to open up our hearts and our lives and to step out and receive you by faith tonight and allow you to penetrate and satisfy. God, we thank you for the life and the life abundantly that you have promised us. Help us to take our eyes off from possessions and pleasure and find our purpose in you. Amen. Invade our lives and our world Change and transform us. And God, give us a hunger and a thirst for you. Yes. In Jesus' name. Amen.